into chapter 11. Chapter 11 deals with investment planning. Um, you can see here that we have several um, activities, once I get that into advanced the screen there, um, several learning goals to go over in this chapter. Um, it's really about deciding how to invest extra money you have and just a little bit about investing, the process of buying and selling investments, and just some of the things you can go through to try to figure out if you have a good investment portfolio or not. Um, so it says here in red, investing is uh, the means by which um, many important financial goals in life are achieved. Um, saving for something big, if it's a, a home, a vacation, um, if it is retirement, uh, college savings, whatever that is, um, investing is a way to help you achieve those goals. I'll let you guys look at these on your own. So the objectives and rewards of investing. Investing is the process of investing money in something, some kind of a financial vehicle such as stocks and bonds uh, for the expectation of receiving some future benefit. If you buy a stock, you're expecting to receive dividends. If you buy a bond, you're expecting to receive interest. And of course, you want the value of your investments to go up. So you, you know, for a stock, you want that value to go up over time so you can sell it and make a capital gain also. Um, speculating is buying an investment uh, where the future value and expected returns are highly uncertain. Um, clearly, that's something to only do if you have money that you are okay losing. Um, typically, you don't want to speculate unless you get a little bit extra money you just want to play with, but normally you wouldn't do that. Uh, most people are risk averse and they only want to invest in something where they feel fairly confident they will get the return that they are assuming that they're going to get. Um, before we invest, you should have sufficient savings for emergencies and adequate insurance coverage, right? So um, don't start investing until you know that you have taken care of a good budget. And this, this chapter is getting towards the end of the book on purpose because chapters 1 through 10, all those have to be squared away before you can do anything in this chapter. So that means you've got plenty of insurance coverage, you've got uh, an emergency fund set aside, you've got savings in case something bad happens. Now you're just investing extra funds to build for the future. Um, it says regularly uh, allocate a portion of earnings for investing, build a pool of invested capital. Um, just set that money aside. Um, have it taken directly from uh, your checking account into some kind of a savings account or just you know just some account separate where that money is going to build up that you can begin to invest it and play with it. Uh, take advantage of automatic and dividend reinvestment programs. Um, if you are a fan of a certain company that's publicly traded, so publicly traded means we can buy the stock of that company, so a lot of big retailers like your Target, Walmart, Best Buy, uh, a lot of other companies you guys be familiar with in terms of like Nike, Under Armour, they're all publicly traded companies. If you want to buy their stock, you definitely can. Not all of them pay dividends, but a lot of them do. So if you want to buy a stock and receive a dividend in return, and you know that you want to buy it for a particular company, um, it's not unusual to be able to go to that website for that company uh, let's just pick on uh, Walmart, for example. You go to walmart.com, find investor relations, and you can um, find the information where maybe you can send them money. They will buy stock for you in an account. And just automatically, any dividends that you earn go right back into your account and buy more shares of stock. That's a really easy and low commission way to invest in a company. Um, it says learn about investments, play trading. Uh, determine financial objectives and read the business press to learn more about investments. So for anybody interested, um, it'd really be for business majors. I know not everybody in this class is a business major, uh, but I do teach an investments class and uh, it's in the fall. So if anybody's ever interested in, in taking that, just you know, go ahead and uh, let me know and we can get you in that. But you have to have managerial finance first. Um, but it, essentially just build up some extra funds that um, you know you can invest, that you've already taken care of all of your personal needs, you're, you've got a budget, you've got all of your day-to-day uh, -day expenses are covered. You want to invest for anything that's left over. Um, so building capital for investment, the question begins um, becomes, how much money will it take you to get started? Do you have to have a lump sum or can you just build by putting money into an account on a regular basis? Um, there's lots of ways to do it. There's no right or wrong. Um, 
so it just there really is no right or way, right, right or wrong way to do this in terms of if you just you know immediately put in a few thousand dollars into an account or you just build it up and, or however you want to do it will work. Um, the work one of the worksheets that you will need for this chapter I've got open uh, worksheet eleven one. This is actually eleven two, which is just simply an inventory of your investment holdings. <coughs> um, this is eleven one, and eleven one. What this one does is determines how much capital that you will need for a financial goal. So at the top here, whoops, you can just put in what your goal is, uh, whatever whatever you want that goal to be. If it's a home, down payment, college savings, retirement, and then it's going to use some future value um, factors and adjustments to um, help you predict how much that you will have. So this will help you figure out a lump sum, how much that will grow to in the future. It will also help you just go, if I just put in regular numbers, you know, I, I put so much per month or per year, I set that aside, how much will that grow to based on growth rates and so on. So it kind of helps you figure out how to get to an end number that you are trying to achieve for investing. And you'll want to be using that for um, your Cengage Now worksheets. And they're showing you that right here um, at the bottom here. They're kind of showing you how to begin to think about that. So what they're saying here is um, just some returns on uh, investments. So, you know, primarily when you begin to invest, most people probably think of stocks, um, buying stocks or bonds or treasury notes. Um, clearly, the higher the risk, the higher the reward, and stocks would have more risk than bonds, and so therefore, you can see the returns on those is different than it is for bonds. Much higher bonds are typically safer, especially if they're U.S. government bonds. And uh, these are longer term, notes are shorter term, that's why they have a little bit different interest rate. But they're showing you what the holding period return is uh, for the S&P 500 at stocks. Um, over the last five years, the last 10 years, the last 15 years, and the last 87 years. The reason the 15-year number is low is 2008 was a really, really bad year. And so that's dragging, that's dragging down the average. By the time we get to um, um, the five-year period, we're, we're beyond that. And so you can see that's why the numbers are so good for uh, the last five years. So building capital, um, determine the amount of savings that you need to raise. Um, you can, the factors are the uh, present value and future value factors from the back of the book. And then your yearly savings is just simply the future amount of money needed divided by the, the future value annuity factor. And then that will help you figure out how much you need to set aside to accomplish a specific goal. Um, so what are your objectives of investing? What are you trying to accomplish? That should always be a part of the plan when you invest. What is this money for? Um, if it's for current income, that's common for retired people, um, they're, invest, they're investing to receive income to live on. Um, or investing for your retirement so that you've got plenty of money to draw down from um, in your retirement years. Uh, major expenditures, if you're buying a home for down payment, college funds, starting a new business. <coughs> There's lots of things that you might be setting money aside for. Um, also, you can use investments to shelter your taxes. Um, there's lots of legal IRS approved ways to invest in certain things that will defer or delay tax or even reduce the tax that you pay. And then an investment plan is a statement, preferably written, that basically walks you through your plan to achieve your investment goals. Now this sounds like a lot to do for an individual, and it is. Um, you can definitely go to some very reputable, reputable people uh, who will help you with these, who will sell you mutual funds or investment plans or annuities that will help you achieve these goals. They won't sell you anything until they figure out what your plan is, they get to know you, they understand what your goals are, they'll try to match your goals and help you write a plan and get those goals towards a uh, end result of a financial plan. So definitely take advantage of one of those people, and I know several, several who are USF grads currently working in the field, and if you need a, a name and a number, I'll be very happy to give that to you. 
Um, so lots of types of investments, common stock, bonds, preferred stocks, convertible bonds, mutual funds, exchange traded funds, notes, real estate. Those are all potential investment vehicles. We'll talk a little bit about each one here. So common stock, as I mentioned, it's just simply ownership of a company. And I mentioned some companies already. Um, you get a return based on dividends or appreciation. Basically, the stock price goes up. So pretty good ways to invest. Um, stocks have more risk, but they also have more reward. A uh, bond is basically a company borrowing money. Um, so corporations issue bonds, cities, school districts, states, um, the federal government, they all issue bonds. When they do that, they're essentially borrowing money from whoever buys the bond. The investor gives whoever issued the bond money, and in return, the investor receives interest and then a repayment of the principal of the bond at the future period whenever the bond matures. They can be bought and sold on a market, just like common stocks are bought and sold on a market. So um, that's what makes bonds and stocks attractive. They're easy to buy and sell. Uh, but you basically, once you buy one, you receive interest. Um, the value of these bonds can go up and down based on the market value of interest in the economy, um, but generally fairly safe investments. Preferred stock and convertible bonds. Uh, preferred stocks are similar to common stocks, except that they pay a fixed dividend, whereas common stocks are not required to pay a dividend. Uh, preferred stocks generally don't fluctuate as much in price, um, so you're not really buying them for the capital appreciation, you're really buying them for the dividends. Uh, preferred stocks can be um, callable or convertible to common stock, depending on the issue of the company. Um, however, they set up that preferred stock issue, they can, they'll can they put that in the contract, essentially. Then you have what they call a convertible bond, a bond that can be converted into a stock. It's called a hybrid security. So when you, when you buy that bond, you know that you're buying a convertible bond that you could elect to convert into stock at some point in the future, whenever you really want to. And you, you really don't do it until it makes sense in terms of the stock price is greater than the bond value. Then you would do it because it'd be making some money. Um, some other types of investments are mutual funds, which actually are probably one of the easiest ways to invest is to buy mutual funds. Uh, mutual funds are managed by uh, professional investors um, they're grouped by category. Uh, there's, there's like all kinds of categories of mutual funds, um, what they call large cap, which is large capitalization companies, medium cap, small cap. Um, you can buy um, emerging, you can buy growth, dividend, uh, international, the list goes on. Um, an exchange traded fund, ETF, is also a very uh, easy thing to invest in. Um, basically, it's an investment that tracks a market. Um, so you can buy an ETF based on the S&P 500, which is a big stock exchange um, tracking index, uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which is also a stock market tracking index. And you can buy ETFs that ex follow exactly the market that they are um, based on. So instead of... You know, the S&P 500 is made up of 500 stocks. So if you wanted to earn the market, um, you'd have to have a proportion of the 500 stocks in the S&P 500. Well, that's really difficult to do. Um, so what you can do instead is buy uh, an ETF based on the S&P 500. So if the market goes up 1%, your value of your ETF went up 1% and vice versa. And then exchange traded notes are um, debt securities. Um, ETNs face market risk and risk default by an issuing bank, uh, but generally investors will get into the top two. Mutual funds and ETFs are both very easy investments to get into. Uh, real estate, uh, clearly a way to invest, um, buying raw land on speculation, hoping that it will go up in value and you can sell it to somebody at some point in time. Clearly that would not generate income. You're just buying it and then waiting for it to go up in value so you can sell it and get the money out. Um, you could buy uh, investment uh, properties, you could buy a share of a commercial property, you could buy um, small rental homes, duplexes, small apartment buildings. Um, those are always options too, of course, then you're going to be earning money through um, uh, rents and capital gains, some tax benefits, that you know, some things you can write off because um, you can deduct certain things for taxes or property tax and so on. And real estate, um, you know, does have some. You know, there's there's risk in real estate depending on where you are. We had 
a large real estate bubble pop back in 2007, 8, and 9. Um, you know, depending on what city you were in, if you were in Sioux Falls, you probably weren't affected by that. But in some very large cities, that was a very bad deal. So a securities market is just simply a place where you can buy and sell securities. There's capital markets, which deal with long-term securities. There's money markets, which deal with uh, low-risk, short-term securities. So when you think of a market, you might you think of high V or your local store, right? A place where you go to buy stuff. And this is no different. A securities market, they don't typically um, have a physical location. Some do. Um, but quite often it can just be done electronically online somehow. So a primary market is where new issues are available for the first time. So when a company decides to go public, um, essentially you've got a privately held company that wants to now incorporate and sell stock of the company. Uh, what they will do then is issue securities through the primary market. And that means an investment bank is working to sell those securities for them to the public and there's lots of steps you have to go through to make that happen um, generally you and i as investors would be buying from the secondary market we basically be, be buying securities that have been previously bought and sold by somebody and their stock exchanges um, like the um, new york stock exchange the nasdaq the otc um, those are those are examples of exchanges that we can buy and sell stocks on. Every company trades on a specific exchange and it really doesn't matter what exchange they trade on. It doesn't change anything about how you buy and sell a stock. Just different exchanges kind of handle different sizes of companies. That's really about the main thing that separates them. And some have a physical location and some do not. Um, so when you have a market, the nice thing about investing in stocks and bonds is there's a market. There's a, it's a very easy to buy and sell them. It's you can do it electronically. It happens very quickly. You know exactly what the price is when you buy and sell, or really close to the price, um, and so it, it makes it very easy. It's no different than walking down to high, you know, going to high V, and I need to buy something, and the price is there. I buy it, and I'm on my way. So it works exactly the same way, just that we do it uh, with with a computer. And so a broker market is when buyers and sellers come together, and a direct trade happens between the two. Um, that's one way to do it. A dealer market, and the buyer and seller never meet, uh, the buyer and seller are each executing orders through dealers, and the dealers are market makers. They're matching up the buyer and the seller um, to make a transaction happen. That's actually really what happens most frequently um, when stocks are bought and sold. This just gives you an example of that, and I know it's hard to see um, on the screen, but just take a look at your book, Exhibit 11.1. And this is just a breakdown of secondary markets. The left-hand side are broker markets, and the right-hand side is more dealer markets. So there's no right or wrong to each. Um, they all do their thing, and they all um, have to if, uh, operate efficiently in order for um, our economy to work, and they, they work very well. So they're a very easy way for buyers and sellers to match up, sell stocks, or bonds or commodities to each other um, very efficiently. Uh, so broker markets or national inter international exchanges, New York Stock Exchange and major exchanges in Europe um, are all examples. Stocks listed on the, these exchanges include 90% of those that are in the Dow Jones Industrial Average and 80% of those that are in the S&P 500. Uh, you also have some smaller regional exchanges um, the New York Stock Exchange, um, similar to the New York Stock Exchange, but focus more on local companies. A dealer market is made up of many market makers who are connected via uh, mass telecommunications network, clearly the internet. Uh, each market maker is a securities dealer who makes a market and one or secure, more securities by doing what they call bid-ask. The ask is what uh, investors pay when buying. The bid is what investors receive when selling. And there's a difference of a few cents between the bid and the ask. And that's how the market makers, basically the securities dealers, make their money is it's only a couple of cents per share. It's a penny or two per share, but they move millions of shares in a day. And so that adds up and that's how they make their money. Um, the NASDAQ OTC um, exchanges 
Uh, NASDAQ stands for National Association of Securities Dealers Automated Quotation System, NASDAQ. Um, it's basically a listed exchange. It has the same status as New York Stock Exchange, although it's been around a really long time and, and was really the first um, all-electronic exchange. Um, Over-the-counter is generally um, stocks that are kind of small. Uh, together they make up the dealer market. So these are treated as dealer exchanges, whereas the New York Stock Exchange is not a dealer exchange. There's a lot of regulation around securities, around investments. Um, the government's just trying to make sure that uh, the public does not get ripped off. Unfortunately, it still happens. Um, but any company that is selling stock of itself is regulated by the SEC. And so they are making sure that um, stock trading and bond trading is fair, that investors have all the information that they need to make decisions, that companies are required to provide certain information at certain intervals, uh, companies have to be audited, all of, the, all of that comes into play to make sure that um, companies are not uh, um, doing bad things to investors, not um, exploiting them, anything like that. So the SEC, that's what their job is. They're not perfect by any means, but uh, that's, that's the goal. Uh, bull market or bear market, you probably heard those terms, bull versus bear. Uh, a bull market is when stocks are generally rising. A bear market is when stocks are generally falling. The past 50 years, the market has been typically very bullish. Um, there's been exceptions. Whenever the company hits a recession of some sort, um, you can see that we've had a few years here in the 2000s, um, not very many. Um, but some of those years are really bad, 2008 in particular. Um, and it says here 2008 was the second worst market performance since 1825. Um, making transactions in the security markets, uh, brokers and account executives and financial consultants buy and sell securities for their consumers, uh, for their customers, I should say. And so when you log on, if you have an account, so it's, first of all, it's very easy to get into the stock market. You can log on to E-Trade, Scott Trade, TD Ameritrade. There's all kinds of companies that will take your money and do this. And they don't need a lot of money to start. Um, some will, will say for $500 you can start investing. Um, so if that's something that you're wanting to do, um, it's not that hard to do. And if you do that, basically you create an account, you send them the money, um, they put that money into your account, and now you can begin to buy and sell investments. Um, and so when you electronically place an order, you're telling um, that company that you're using to go out and buy shares for me. Same thing when you sell. You're, you're placing an order that they go and then fulfill. A stock broker is somebody who understands investment objectives, and will um, help you pursue them. So somebody who will help you understand uh, what your goals are, what you want to achieve, and try to make that happen. You can buy, you can go through a full service broker. Um, you're going to pay for that. Um, it's a little bit more expensive because you're using their time. Um, you can also go what they call a discount broker, which is kind of the, some of the ones I just mentioned, um, like TD Ameritrade, E-Trade, Scott Trade. Um, you really aren't getting any advice from them. They have a lot of material on their website that you can look at to do your own research into particular investments, uh, but you would not get a live person to give you advice. You'd have to pay extra for that. Uh, investor protection. So any money that you give to a stockbroker is protected. Just like money that you have in a bank account is protected, uh, the government has insurance programs in place uh, through the SEC. And basically, so um, you are protected. You have insurance um, um, in your account for $500,000, $100,000 in cash, and then the other part of that is in stocks. So if something happens to that broker, um, they go out of business, whatever that is, uh, you potentially now are protected um, through uh, the federal government's programs. Um, executing trades. Um, Typically done online nowadays. You can do it with your smartphone, clearly, your tablet, your computer, just as long as you've got some connection to the internet, you're good to go. Um, they typically just take a minute or two. They, they happen very, very quickly. Um, there's 
three different orders that you can place. A market order is basically just saying, I will trade now, buy or sell, um, at the price right now. So if you know if I want to buy um, a share of Best Buy, and I'm okay with whatever the price is, this given moment in time, I put in a market order and I buy it. And I do the same thing on the sell side. A limit order is if this stock reaches a certain price, I'm either going to buy it or sell it. So let's just pretend that Best Buy sells for 50, and I think that's too high. I think you know I like Best Buy, I want to buy that, the stock. But 50 is too high for me. I think it's overvalued. And so I could put an order saying, I'll buy it at 40. So the second it goes down to 40, the system says, oh, Steve wants to buy uh, a share of Best Buy for 40 bucks. We'll make it happen. As long as that money's in my account, as long as there's cash in my brokerage account to cover that trade, it will happen. If I don't have the cash in my account, the trade won't happen. A stop loss order works the same way. It's basically saying I'm going to sell a stock if it reaches a certain price. So let's just say I bought Best Buy at 40 um, and I'm expecting it to go up. But just to, in case it goes down, I can put in a stop loss at let's just say 35. So if it goes down to 35, the stock automatically sells. Okay, because basically I'm just saying. I only want to lose five dollars on it. I don't want to lose more than that. So, and if so, if it hits thirty-five, I'm just out. You know, clearly, if I didn't hit do the stop loss order and it went down to thirty-five, I would still own it, and it might go back up. You know, I would hope that it would. But if I just don't want it, if it hits thirty-five, I can put in what they call the stop loss order and make that happen. To calculate your return on an investment, you take the ending value. You subtract the beginning value and you add income. So income would be dividends for stocks or interest for bonds and divide that by the beginning value and that gives you what your return is. This just gives you an example of that. And you'll be doing a little bit of this um, when you do some of the Cengage work. So you, this is a great example to follow right here with the Disney stock. Um, you can also use margin. Um, trades and short sales. Um, I would say as a beginning investor do not do either one until you believe that you are more confident in your skills um, and you've gained some experience doing this. But normally I would tell most people don't even worry about doing this. Margin is basically borrowing money from your stock broker and using that money to buy more stocks. Now it can help you make more money. You can borrow money to make more money. Um, but if the stocks that you buy on margin go down in value, um, you're in trouble. You're going to have a problem and have to do what they call a margin call and put more money into your account. A short sale is essentially, there's, there's a whole chapter in my investments class, it's essentially um, borrowing a security and then expecting the value of that security to go down in the future. So you borrow it, and then in the future, you buy it cheaper and pay back the stock with the lower price stock that you get in the future. You're betting on a stock to go down with a short sale. Um, normally, it, it's really not that complicated, but it's kind of counterintuitive. So I would just say for most people, don't worry about that. Um, if you're more experienced in investing, definitely you can do that. So as you are researching stocks and trying to decide um, what kind of investments to get into, um, this is a good page here to kind of think about. And this information is clearly in your book. And I've got a couple of links in my .usf to help you out with this too. Um, but essentially what you're doing is you are um, deciding um, how to invest. You're, you make, you're getting information, you're doing some research and deciding what kind of companies to get into. And this will help you do this. Lots of research is required. One good way to learn about a company is to read the company's annual report. Once per year the company will issue a report to shareholders. Uh, there will be a letter from the CEO. They'll highlight um, the good and the bad from the last year. I'll talk about what they want to accomplish in the next couple of years. Uh, there will be financial statements. They're audited. Um, an auditor will issue a report. And there will be notes to the financial statements kind of explaining all the gory details about the financial position of the company. Um, managing your holdings. Um, building a diversified portfolio was important. Uh, a combination of stocks, bonds, and short-term investments. 
um, having a good um, what they call asset allocation between long term and short term to kind of meet your goals also is important and it says here to see exhibit 11.7 in your chapter uh, to get some um, optimal allocations between uh, age and family and that's where a good um, investment planner a financial advisor can give you some really good advice about that based on your goals your age your family situation they can kind of give you some good ideas about how to uh, come up with a portfolio of investments that will you know be the best for you and then tracking investments just essentially just um, having a spreadsheet that says here's what I own Here's the value. This, you know, having that all together in one document helps you make decisions better. And this, this is part of that same worksheet. So they've got an example of it here, but I had it open in Excel. Um, let's see, it is right there. Um, so that's just the same thing, just a list of your investments and how much they're worth. So that is Chapter 11.